I will just uh, start with a little introduction and then we go right to the reading. Uh, I just ask everyone to keep their mics uh, muted uh, for the duration of the reading. Mm -hmm. And then we will have discussions and question and answers. And for that, I will ask everyone to turn on their mics so we can have a discussion, all of us together. It is so good to see all your faces, all familiar faces here. We are um, gathered for the reading of um, Dua Al-Bustani, Safa Fathi, Rachel Levitsky. Safa Fathi, I'm so sorry. Uh, I saw Safa Fathi's uh, name here and I can't uh, think of anything else. Um, Rachel Levitsky, Sophie Sita, and uh, in the last second, unfortunately, Kay Gabriel couldn't make it to the reading. So we're very fortunate to have Carlos Soto Roman, uh, who we published his book last year by Pominar Press to attend and read from that book. Thank you very much, Carlos. Just to start for the little introduction, I have to tell you that uh, today is uh, Pominar's birthday. And this is one of those birthday parties that the host uh, won't tell you it's their birthday. You just go there to realize uh, everyone else knew. But uh, we celebrated um, Pominar's um, first uh, publication, Stephen uh, Emerson's poster poem landmark here in London on Upper Street in a cafe that doesn't exist anymore. And uh, then followed by Carlos uh, Soto Roman's book uh, in October. Um, then we had um, uh, the anthology of visual poetry called uh, Temporal Spaces, uh, gathered by our editor, Astra Papakristidulu. And uh, right now we are uh, launching two uh, poetry books, one by uh, Rachel Levitsky, Against Travel, Anti-Voyage, and uh, one um, book of plays by Sophie Sita, My Little Enlightenment Plays. In the beginning, I, uh, we will begin with um, a video by Doa Al-Bostani. This will be aired because Doa can't uh, join us on Zoom. She tried, uh, she was a couple of times online and offline, hopefully by the end of at the question and answers time, uh, she can join us. But uh, right now her internet connection doesn't allow her to join us. And then she will also explain um, at the recording that uh, what is the problem uh, with her joining uh, Zoom and be here right now. I read from uh, her biography. Doa Al-Bustani Al-Fatuhi is a poet and English language teacher from Hama, Syria. She's currently working to complete her dissertation in field of criticism and literary theory to earn a master's in English language. Her work appears in Harana Poetry Magazine, Ice Flow Press, and uh, we also um, were privileged to have uh, one of her poems published at uh, Pominar Online Magazine. I invite everyone to take a look. There's a recording of that poem as well. Hello, everyone. I hope you're keeping well and safe. Uh, this is Jua, and this is my first poetry reading. I'm a little bit nervous but I'm so happy and excited to be reading tonight alongside other fabulous uh, fellow poets. Uh, I should tell you that this is a pre-recorded video, which means I'll be also watching and attending the event on Monday. One reason why, unfortunately, I can go live or read on Zoom is that a part of the sanctions imposed on my country, Syria, has made accessing into some apps like Zoom not that flexible, as is the case in other countries, but thanks to Paminor Press for suggesting this alternative way of doing this. The first poem that I'd like to read to tonight is called The Fog, uh, and it's published in issue 3 of Harana Poetry magazine, alongside Duality, uh, which I'm going to read next. 
the Fog uh, is one of the earliest English poems that I've ever written. Uh, I was evolving my poetic voice in English back then and uh, it's um, a poem that depicts what it's like to, to be living in a war-torn country like mine, what it's like to be um, witnessing things falling apart around you. It captures that sense of despair and uncertainty uh, about the future and what it may hold for us as uh, everything is melting like an iceberg. So here's the fog. The fog. The fog feels arrogant. The fog feels triumphant, for it has killed the last glimpse of our city. It is singing. All the faces are distorted now. All the voices are blurred by broken sentences. The fog feels arrogant. The fog feels triumphant, for it has killed the last color of my city. It is singing. All the children have white beards now. All the tears are masked by false giggles. Can you hear my blurred voice? Can you see me in my blue coat? The fog is sneaking into it. The fog is turning me into another colorless shadow of our city. What do I need now? What do we need now? A warm hand, a new constant color, and a trusting innocence for the children who have white beards now. The second poem, the second poem that I'm going to read is Duality. It's a bit of funny and ironic poem that shows the dominance of second language. I think that may sound relatable to second language speakers as we always feel like there are two worlds and two voices inside of us uh, once we master uh, a second language. Uh, I wrote this uh, poem after I realized that the English spelling of my name is the first half of the word duality and this is exactly what I feel as an English teacher and as someone who who's trying to write now poetry in English I feel like there are two worlds and uh, to, to us, Arab speakers, uh, our names sometimes consist of difficult sounds and when we have to write the spelling of our names in English, some of these sounds must be altered or must be uh, replaced with uh, another easier one, which makes uh, the whole matter sound like we have a second name. So this is the poem, Duality. Since I learned the second tongue, my voice is split in two. One that echoes my grandmother's proverbs, another that mimics things strangers say. Since I learned to write the second tongue, the spelling of my name has shrunk. From four letters found in Dua to three in the second tongue. Difficult sounds replaced with easier ones. You could say my name has lost some of its character and Dua has become one half of this strange duality. The third poem that I'd like to read is uh, Al Asi, the Disobedient, or, or Al Asi, the Disobedient. It's published uh, as a part of geography series at Isoflow Press. Um, and uh, as you know, the Orontes River, unlike other rivers, flows northwards. It flows from south to the north, which makes uh, Arab speakers call it uh, Al Asi, which means the disobedient. So I use this river in my poem as a symbol to highlight those groups of people who are discriminated against or who are other just because they're different, just because they go against the stream. Um, so this uh, poem is not only about the Orontes River, it's also about these groups. Uh, so this poem is dedicated to you guys. Al-Asi, or Al-Asi, the disobedient. How much does it take the city to realize her river can't be her accessory. How much does it take her to know that he can't be blamed 
for the boat, for the fisher king, for the thigh wound? How much does it take the city to believe the fisher's fishing has nothing to do with her infertility? Stop spitting on my banks. Every time the rain falls to make you more barren. Every time the raindrops start tickling my aqua body. Stop blaming the clouds for not talking the sun into coming out. She won't come. The RNTs goes on. Woman would walk to the river long ago, covered in black, head to toe. They would, th they would throw in him much of their femininity, not revealed to the city's men. They would confide in him, their henna-dyed locks, their placentas after each birth. The river became ster sterile, the city's womb. How could I feel at home while I'm running through three different worlds at once? How could I feel accepted while I'm flowing from south to the north? How could I feel embraced by the maps while geography books call me al asi the disobedient, the RNT's streams in? Water wheels are men's mountains, climaxes to throw themselves from, falling, filling the river's body. The city calls them the river's rats. Men disappear, drown and die, floating with the placentas in their hands, no baby comes alive to the surface. How much does it take the city to know that her river can't be her lover? The last poem that I'd like to read tonight is uh, a kind of feminist poem. It's uh, called Men Calf, Therefore They Are. It's published at Baminar online magazine. And it's a feminist poem with a satirical tone which shows the nature of patriarchal societies. I remember having a brainstorm of uh, the meanings and connotations of uh, the calf produced by men in my conservative society and to my surprise it turned out that there were more than 10 meanings, seriously. So I, I was amazed by my ability to, to know what a calf means in every social context. Um, so this is a poem about the patriarchal societies and how men are able to, to assert their supremacy, to prove their dominance just by using the simplest gestures or by using the simplest uh, the simplest signs as a cuff. Men cuff, therefore they are. Why do men cuff here whenever there's a woman around? A voluntary sign? A non-verbal communication? Or a way to say she's a speck of dust? Their cuff says we are here now. Their cuff says what brought you here? Their cuff says run, we will chase you, but not now. Their cuff says, yalla yalla, cover yourself before men come and don't be seen. Their cuff says, hide, we will seek you, but not now. Their cuff says, we're told to do so. Their cuff says, we're virtuous. Their cuff says, mind your manners so we can mind ours. Their cuff says, we are here, waiting, won't you open your window? Their cuff says, Eve, don't lure us. Their cuff says, we're done. Their cuff says, we have hoarse voices. Their cuff says, don't raise your soft voice, don't be heard. Their cuff says, we're behind, watching, step aside, let us pass. Their cuff says, we don't like your talk. Their cuff says, what's your presence compared to ours? A form of absence, men cuff, therefore they are. This is all I wanted to read tonight. Thank you for attending the event, for listening and watching. I really wish I could join the online discussion. Again, thank you Pamina Press for hosting this poetry reading. Um, until next time, take good care of yourselves. Don't rush poems because they are going to come at their perfect time. Good, uh, have a great night. Have a great night, you all. Goodbye. Well, thank you, Joe, and I hope you 
manage to listen it and uh, be, be able to watch it. Such a strong uh, poem. I'm so sorry that we couldn't uh, air it better, but I'm glad that it's on YouTube and you can watch it again and uh, share it, please. And, um, and I really hope that uh, Dua can join us um, in the end because she's, she keeps trying uh, connecting on, um, on Zoom. And uh, as she said, because of the sanctions on Syria, she's not able to access Zoom. Um, she won't be able to um, directly communicate with us. Well, shame on Zoom and shame on countries who are imposing sanctions on her country. Um, she's writing to me that um, she can't join the Zoom. This is the email of hers just uh, arrived. Plus, we have only had four hours of electricity since I got home at 10.30 a.m., which means the generator could fail me at any moment. So uh, the chances of uh, she being able to, uh, for her to be able to, uh, to answer her questions are lower, but, uh, but I can forward any email um, if you want to talk to her um, right. about her poems. Well, uh, next, uh, let me introduce Rachel Levitsky and uh, her book that's going to be launched today, uh, Against Travel, Anti-Voyage. Oh, it's white on white, you can't see it, but this is a great book. Um, Rachel Levitsky came out as a lesbian in 1984 and as a poet in 1994. She is the author, Under the Sun, Future Poem, 2003, Neighbor, UDP 2009, Ugly Ducklings Press. The poetic novella, The Story of My Accident is Ours, uh, further poem 2013, and uh, numerous chapbooks, most recently Against Travel, Anti Voyage, a bilingual edition with Pascal Poyet, and published by Pominar in 2020. In 1999, she founded Belladonna which is now Belladonna Collaborative. She is professor of writing at Pratt Institute, Naropa University Summer Writing Program, and occasionally at lay poetry institutions like Poets House and the Poetry Project in New York City. More information about Rachel can be found at www.rachellevitsky.com. Rachel. And I have to add that uh, you also will read uh, one of uh, Pascal's translations and uh, Iris Colomb uh, will kindly read uh, another poem in French, the translation of your work. Hi everyone, it's wonderful to be here. Dua, thank you so much for your beautiful work and your amazing reading. And Sophie, I'm really excited to hear you, and also Carlos. I want to say Kay Gabriel, who couldn't make it here today, is um, an, an incredible activist who was one of the people that created Abolition Park in um, City Park here um, in New York all summer. And is no doubt, the, the reason why she can't be here is because she's involved in an action, I'm sure, about the Justice for Brianna Taylor. So um, we'll get to hear her another time. She's an amazing poet. Look her up, Kate Gabriel. Um, I want to first thank Ghazal and Pominar, Michelle and Hamid, and everyone, Iris, Tessa, all the people, but especially Ghazal. I want to just say that um, this past five years has been a pretty traumatic time for me, um, I, everybody, but um, it began with a lot of incidents and I, uh, although I've been writing the whole time, it's been, I've kind of had a resistance to collecting my work into a book. And uh, there was a, a way that Ghazal, by offering to publish this small book against travel anti voyage, it just enabled me to just do something and do something in the context of relation and friendship, um, which made it feel doable and it feels great and it's a beautiful book and I love it. 
Thank you so much. I'm so honored to be with Carlos and Sophie and everybody else that you're publishing. And I also, also want to thank Suzanne Goldenberg, who, um, because I gave her an assignment to do these against travel poems and then started doing them with her, it was really productive for me. And I, um, and I just want, she's in there all the time. Against travel for Dana. I dream en route from St. Petersburg, Mississippi to St. Louis, Florida. My vampire lovers are precariously situated in a novel by James Hanahan. More numbers of us are vampires than originally thought. All of us. You can tell by the loose and missing skin of our teeth. Our outfits were cut out skimpily in V's. So skimpy. The queen who could fly flew away from all of it. Maybe I am she. They say I am. I want to say I told you so to one of you in particular. What good does foresight do and who needs it when you are like me, queen vampire who can, but doesn't always fly away? Yeah, sometimes I stay. I earn a mouthful and keep it to myself as I am, as they say I am. I think that's a feminist poem. Kind of in conversation with Dua's complaint. Um, of course, it's wonderful to be participating in an international press as Ghazal and Pominar is just incredibly global. Um, so I will give a little description of what preceded this poem, which is that a couple of years ago in the um, Academy Awards, Oprah Winfrey gave a good talk, gave a good speech, and people were clamoring for her to run for president. Against travel, Oprah, our president, gives perspectives. A little dirt, she says. No, wait, what she said was, it's a catastrophe, but not for me. The neighbors who were then my lovers, not the ones eating my salted liver, those with bodies upon which I request the steer of your sweetened attention. Seriously, please think about them. You walk down my street. You wonder which of us comes from here, or how this all began. Pleistocene, Walmart, look, exactly. The zeros on her shoes tell you all the parts of her story. More than her rosacea, gnarled hands, the gouged out glass eye. Here's how we do it when we love you in California. Greet the sniper who replaces you. Eat the snails they leave on your outhouse stoop. Air kiss signals abdication or death by condominium. In the canyon, we reassemble broken bones. We built the steam room on. An erotic, a mistaken triangulation. And one of the things I'm thinking a lot about is um, small press and um, the decision that so many of us make, or, or many of us make to stay with Stall Press or, or the kind of negotiation between amplifying your voice more, uh, distributing your voice more thoroughly, or being in relation in the distribution of your work. And um, I feel like that's kind of, in some ways, what that poem was about in terms of California and Hollywood and money and Etc. Um, okay, so in this next poem, uh, Iris has offered to read the French, and I thought maybe we could start with the French and then go to English. Iris, if that's something that you'd like to do. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Is I can hear you great. Can we pin you? Sorry? Can we pin you? Oh, I don't, I, uh, yeah, I, I don't know, maybe. Um, I'm pinning you, but maybe everybody can pin you. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, anti-espoir. Aujourd'hui, nous avons la même dispute. Cette fois, nous sommes dans une pièce avec des gens qui sont à un certain égard plus intelligents que moi. Donc, cette fois, 
Notre différence me fait me sentir petite. Comment elle a appelé ça Il se peut qu'elle ait appelé ça triomphalisme et cela fera très bien l'affaire. Carla a dit que lorsqu'elle parlait d'espoir, cela n'avait rien à voir avec l'espoir dont je dis qu'il élit les présidents. C'est un espoir politique, dit Carla, utopique et semé dans des désirs minables, engendrés par les femmes pour rejeter leur classe et les chaînes de leur genre et couvrir de honte ces quelques hommes bons dans une position qui ne soit pas annihilante. Je n'ai pas répondu à la lettre de Nick. J'ai réalisé que je ne lui avais écrit que parce que c'était le jour de l'année où mon amie avait été retrouvée morte et qu'il m'avait repoussée. Quand tu disparais comme ça, comme un chat, je disparais aussi. Against Hope Today we have the same argument. This time, we are in a room with people who are smarter than me in a certain respect. So this time our difference makes me feel small. What did she call it? She could have called it triumphalism and that will work fine. Carla said when she speaks of hope, it has nothing to do with the hope that I say elects presidents. It's a political hope. Carla says utopian and seeded in seedy desires spawned by women who reject their class and gender shackles to shame those few good men into a position that doesn't annihilate. I haven't written Nick back. I realized I wrote him just because it was the day in the year when my friend was found dead and he refused me. When you disappear like that, just like a cat, I disappear too. So there's um, a constant, uh, I, I'm interested in uh, complaint as a speech act in terms of like whether it does something or not. I'd love to talk to anybody about that if they have thoughts. And one of the constant complaints in my work is against certain words, I think, and what, definitely one of them is hope. And, not, and the kind of the words that come into vogue or come, become something that is used kind of in a capitalist uh, uh, propagation. And um, resilience, of course, is a word that has taken that on in the past few years. And um, the next poem has a complaint against that. It's also for Marcella Durand and a mazel is like a, means um, luck in, in Hebrew. And um, it's sometimes a name, mazel. And also I just wanna say it's Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur today. And I always think Yom Kippur is such a sad day. And I have noticed that because the world has been so sad, it's a little less sad on Yom Kippur. Um, against travel for Marcella, mazel. I was reading the pages again. No, the sentences, the words, aware of concentration and the facts, weather and news, and not but, a comma, the transition from event to object, until I wasn't any more so pointed. My job, dumb in a way, not dumb in a way. The only way I want to write about anything is in a poem. The only way to write a poem may be an unpunctuated question. Ultimately, the story, fuck, your, their, our, the, it, her, resilience, by which I mean, enjoy it while you can. And I'm gonna read this one in French because it's perverse of me to read it in French. In a way, I've been um, trying to learn French my whole life and uh, this, last six months during COVID, I've been reading Proust to Natalie Rosanis in Brussels as a way to learn French. And it's probably been the most effective thing I've ever done toward my lifelong failure of learning French. Anti-voyage pour Marcella Mazel. Je relisais les pages, non, les phrases, les mots, conscient de la concentration et des faits, temps et nouvelles, et non, mais, une virgule, la transition entre l'avènement et l'objet, jusqu'à ce que je ne sois plus aussi pointu. Mon boulot, idiot dans un sens, pas, pas idiot dans un sens. La seule façon dont je vais écrire sur quoi 
que ce soit ses dents en poème. La seule façon d'écrire un poème pourrait être une question sans ponctuation. À terme, l'histoire va te les nus le la faire foutre avec la résilience. Par quoi je veux dire, profite sans tant que tu peux. And um, I'm going to end with a, a couple of poems that are in other publications um, in the Against Travel series. And um, one is in, and I'm going to, oh, and I just want to thank Pascal Poyer. I'm so lucky to work with him over the years. He's a, 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 a genius translator and a genius thinker, and he's got a lot of projects. And the current one is a, um, an ongoing performance through translating Shakespeare to French. And I'll put links in the chat after I'm done reading, but he's someone whose work is, um, is in a mo performance modality. And there's many events that you can see of his. And um, also he has translated a, uh, a pantheon of people in his um, series, Contretement. Against Travel for Maddie. Money and destruction have a good question. Looking luxurious, typing mournful devastation for all the ones out there. See invention. He who I'll call gay is gayer than expected, by which I mean less passing than his love who I'll call Sam. Sam's a public American, by which I mean United Statesian, where it's hard for him to love to look at his own delection. Sam thanks heavens for the sweetness of a common, his loss of love hum, his sister could benefit from Obamacare and votes for Trump. That could be a headline. We went to a foray, which is a forest, meaning trees. We renamed the Battle River. Sam calls the good friend a once short-term lover. Gay says they were for 10 years a go-go. We drank champagne from the farm. Gay found the king. Sam went under the table, frowned on the glittering crown. Failing song, I took to the bath, my torso in one room feet in another. And I'll end, and that comes um, out of a wonderful press called Black Sunlit, um, who in, here in Brooklyn, uh, it's a project of Jared Fagan, uh, and the magazine is called Vestige, and the issue is called Lacuna. Um, and this is uh, an it was an amazing little book, back again to the small press, this is a one-off uh, chapbook that the artist Clarity Haynes, who paints, has a, you can follow her on Instagram, she paints women's breasts and torsos. Um, and this is uh, Genevieve, P, Genevieve P. Porridge, who recently died. And um, she had this show called Altered States of Alters that was phenomenal. Um, against Travel for Suzanne, who's the person who also is doing Against Travel poems. I came here to the museum in order to move something below the realm of form from the left to the right into the bundles of babies by lesbians of all things and older blind children, orphaned and parented, unafraid of rough touch sensation given them in order to see. The question of what Elizabeth said was part of the dream in which maybe I miss someone I miss every day. Not false memory about Elizabeth of her moment, that moment when everything happens happens to her alone. My new friend is writing a book. She eyes me with the depth of something unspeakable, sucking life in the form of skin made papery around her eyes. I want an adjective for that skin, not withered nor brittle or about to crack, more thin, beige, hungry and thirsty, easily torn, portmanteau rejecting frangible for skin flake. She writes in translation, come, life can be simple. And whether I do or not, want to or not, nothing will change for Elizabeth after all these years, ferreting my books in a language she doesn't like to read for a price she can't really afford, while I'm thinking about how far you are, thinking, yes, life can be simple, full of easy love, the ever presence of cherished bodies that have passed and the ones that as yet haven't. Thank you so much. Wow, thank you, Rachel. That was a beautiful reading. Thanks a lot. Of course, we'll talk about it afterwards, but uh, now I introduce our next reader, Sophie Sita. 
Sophie is an interdisciplinary artist, writer, and educator who works with text, sound, and translation. Her practice is embedded in queer feminist collaborations and spans different media such as performance, poetry, installation, and video. Sita works internationally on various projects and has performed and presented her work in several places, including New York, London, New Delhi, Santiago de Chile, Berlin, Vilnius, and Amsterdam. She currently is an assistant professor at Boston University, co-organized the Sound Text Seminar at Harvard, and is on the faculty of New Masters uh, Program in Writing for Performance at Cambridge. Sita is also among the cohort of this year's Constellations Artist Development Program, organized by UP Project and Flat Times House. Sophie. Thank you, Gazal. So um, I, uh, I don't think there's like a correct way of pronouncing my surname, but I usually say Seta because it's Italian. Um, in German, it would be Zeita, which sounds a bit like um, page or string, like the, the page of a book or the string of an instrument. Um, but yeah, I usually kind of say Seta. Um, yeah. It's okay. It's okay. I mean, I don't, I don't really mind. I think it's nice to have like, uh, you know, multilingual pronunciations of your name. Um, and yeah, um, but it kind of links to what I'm going to say now, uh, namely that these pieces um, that Ghazal published so beautifully, um, My Little Enlightenment Plays, are performance pieces that originated on the page as sort of closet dramas, queer closet dramas, but that also demanded to be performed uh, and then became these uh, multimedia performance pieces. And um, I'm going to share my screen because I want to show you some uh, pictures so you have a sense of what they are like. Um, so a lot of, I'm just going to click through some images because I want, before I read, I just want you to imagine that um, these texts were kind of performed uh, in different site-specific spaces, often with other uh, women and queer artists. Um, I also often collaborated with other people who maybe made uh, costumes for me or who um, made um, music or I wrote music with them. Um, I also then uh, invited uh, people to uh, yeah take pictures and then made kind of um, yeah just kind of different different media that that kind of came into the project so some of them were obviously solo performances but some of them were um uh, collaborative performances and yeah so i just wanted to show you some images and the costumes were always kind of textual or i think of them as very kind of as a translation of of the text. So costume and space were kind of, or, uh, installation were kind of uh, translations of the text. Um, this was an installation at, uh, uh, for Art Night at the Oxford Tower. And that's a sound piece. So I'm going to show you a bit more. And some of them were kind of installations of text in space. Um, or yeah, as you can see, often the text is also maybe printed on a costume and then I or the other performers would read off the costume. Um, okay, um, and so I'm going to play you a sound piece. I hope it's going to be okay, but imagine that you are inside this worm-like structure as you were listening. Um, so let's see if that works. Tell me in the chat if it, if it doesn't work. Um, and then we'll see. It's just quite short. Okay, let's see. Scene four, red baiting. The Queen and Marchioness de Mondekar enter. It's clearly the brunt of the environment. 
Let's be honest, the Spanish Inquisition was a little more stressful. Peace, peace, ladies. Let's not gripe about it. Everybody goes, oh, it's like this or that all the time. The change, the disparity, the conversion rates. Our little brains can tell the difference. There's a predator behind us and around us pretty much all the time. It's cortisol, cortisol. Suddenly, instead of plowing the fields, getting the potatoes, we have to have A stars. Now that's abstract. That's the way humans function at their best. I think someone here has a little negative tendency. Let's call it nervosité. Do you want to waste energy about it? I'm eaten. I'm out of the game. And then you look around and it's dark and mischievous and your neighbour's making muffins at three in the morning again and you wonder, should I do that? They get hit double ways, old chap. Always comes with a little side packet of fear. This is literally killing me. The home is the haven in a heartless world. Hum, hum. Very good. That was your moment of enlightenment. No repose. Let me help you bring your heartbeat down. You need the flesh of another human being. Oh, hard-nosed adrenaline. It's a fantastic resource for mums in the home. I've got to rest now. Now with neuroplasticity, we know we are not a package that just came into the world like this. Why are all these people dying? Okay. And now I'm going to read. So this is from um, a piece called Don Carlos or Royal Jelly. Um, and uh, I should maybe also say that all of these pieces are what I have called either imagined conversations or translational tete-a-tete with enlightenment writers, thinkers, scientists, and pseudoscientists. So I've basically been in conversation with these different people and played with their words and with mine. Um, and the plays in the title is both a generic description, uh, but also a verb. So my little enlightenment plays is playing like a tune in my head that I can't get out of my head. Um, and um, I'm going to read uh, an epilogue to one of the pieces. Uh, and it's spoken by a kind of deus ex machina figure who comes in at the end of the piece. And this is, I might have some water. This is from a piece called Les Bijoux en Descray or Paper Tigers. And that plays with Diderot, um, Fontenelle um, and Margaret Cavendish. So epilogue. Whenever I'm stuck, I just turn my eyes towards these galactic luminaries, my delicate communion with your, 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 Oh, you unhappy eyes. Whether deception occurs when observing the eternal stars is not really the right question, not a favorable flexion of your extra ocular muscles. I know that any star not over the zenith is truly a penny seen below water, and therefore the authorities and extracurricular agents say that heaven is fourfold, refracted, redacted, accidental and utterly unsentimental. Another conclusion would be that every line falls obliquely, but together the lines do not appear as a perfect circle, like a pea or a pearl. There is harmony in similarity, which is just another way of saying natural philosophy is our real love affair that doesn't add up. For me, a tugging, wrenching sight is a gift from the firmament in this world in which I don't want anything else except light that is not hung or like a curtain concealed against that nimble seeing, which is theatrical, dramatically structured for blurry eyes. This is my method of exhaustion. I'm not exactly blind, but being someone who walks the precipice, I'm incorrigible. When they talk to me, they might not know. After all, reality is there to be corrected. It has to allow it. I direct these shadows and those shapes. 
I adore that splodge or blot over there as perhaps something knowable. Now, you might think, what sweet palaver. I'm just another who discovers poetry in the flapping of forte pianos, comptometers, dictational earpieces, phonographs, and cryptographs, slopping a little bit of that cerebral sustenance onto tables in the mellifluent bowl of some reverberating celestial vaults. Oh, pace myself, order my life. Sometimes when I cannot read these incendiary scriptures for all their illuminated bombast, I simply make up a likely hypothesis, which usually does just as well. For example, I do not know why someone's bonnet or briquette catches fire, but I do know about the labor of reason. So I turn to my old friend and say, Dear Karl Marx, ma petite minette, you ought to know better. You're an inquiring intelligence. Why these bibliographic fantasies? Sit down for a moment. You are likely to be impatient, even critical and sarcastic with those who cannot match your frantic rhythm. But you are adaptable. You always think of the future, of action, of objects, because you constantly need to be on the move. Beware, however, not to confuse obstinacy with intransigence. You are happy as long as your mind is in turmoil, and even then, you need to have plenty of people around, people who listen to you, unless you are the one to glean for yourself here and there the intellectual food you are so fond of. And then my friend might say, I have to confess I'm slightly unnerved by this slab of flesh on fire. So I'm just inventing this confessional sinner, driving home the nail into the wall of a curious but detached audience. Come to think of it, this could be a nice little show. Well, dear one, since you are so well trained in stunning movements, I would suggest removing the parapet and coming right out with it. It's okay, you're upset. I'm not upset. Like the majority of earth signs, Karl Marx, you're efficient, concrete, and not too emotional. What matters to you is what you see. You judge the tree by its fruits. But appearance and reality are two different things, aren't they? You're a kind of a genius, so it's no big deal. Nobody tires of your company because you are always planning things and suggesting portentous excursions. Obviously, so many movements for one man may scare people off, and some may even criticize your brutality and your tendency to lose your temper. But you are so warm and genuine, so expansive. Isn't that a good thing? Little indication was given of how we were to spend our hours. Weep with us, O oh, Marx, be it said not sadly of us, we have done that which we had to do. O oh, my heart's non pare, I would say that space is truly invisibly and indivisibly drastic and therefore touchable. Here's my map of the world, my astronomer's guide in big print. Now let's hear the whole truth before anyone gets into an argument. Look here, I'm just reading from a random page. Well, this is nice. Okay, and now I'm going to play you one more sound piece and share my screen again. Um, let's see. Again, a short one. Interlude. Pale face and happy face appear at the corner of the stage, engaged in a board game. But I confronted the monster. I am a sexless caterpillar. Your honesty redeems you. I was livelier than the rest of the kids. I didn't make any friends. I just fell in love. 
Place your heart next to mine with a knife, with a knife. Woohoo! I am totally transformed. The unlikelihood of the saving power, of philanthropy, of figures of the past, of reaching the edge of the field, of finding the penknife, of writing the claws. The claws. Oh, come on. Under my instructions, a snow leopard appeared. Here, in the heat of Spain. All oh, grey, all oh, grey, I carve out the lung in a ripe diameter to sit on it. The field is large. My friends are close. Certain famed missionaries are very influential. Just saying. I feel replenished. I call my allies to action. Let the blood of our hearts ooze simultaneously. Let's lick frantically at the sore, breathing. Oh, oh great, great men at the, the edge, edge of the field, field. women and rise and, and gather. gather. Oh, oh great, great men with bags full of projectiles. Oh, oh great men, you will die. A pantomime. In a moment of exertion, the whole world, its history, its horrors, its elegant incoherence, stretches out before the gathered minions, sycophants, coaxers, and cajolers, all courtiers and high-born caterpillars. And then, in another moment of radical beauty, shudders, collapses, folds, like papier-mâché turrets, quailing. And I'm going to end on a short extract from the last piece in here, Emilia Galotti's coloring book of feelings. Making the world the persistent proof that forces do exist, that encounters do matter, that the shuttling of one's little poetic intensities make little impingements upon the eye and ear and lo and behold, maybe even the ever fretting heart Feeling arises out of some momentary, sometimes prolonged and crazy resonances passing between minds, between bodies. Feelings at their most obstinate refuse the rhythm of mathematics. Sometimes they float alongside comprehension and dates and formulas, viscerally eloquent toward the extrusion of thought. So bodies exist. They make lateral choices, their innards shimmer, which is the task of the translator to bring out the shimmer. For example, if you stretched that left arm or that right leg, you'd become unrecognizably body. Or more prosaically, you'd fix an itch, adjust some muscular tension. And then we could all go for a good glass of sherry and say, there you go, now we know what this body, this language can do, what a lovely day. But then you discover a freckle and another and another and another and it's unforeseen lockstep you'd step into some generalizable theory of knowledge. Balancing on the pliancy on which rests that expansion of seesaw recognition of desire, you trip flatteringly, a body hitched to the tenderness of an imagination. Orsina and Emilia listen intently, without much to go on, but they go on anyway, in the rondo of their ostentatious love of speaking in bouquets of nosegays and violently cute violets. Maybe someone tells them calmly, it's bedtime, and holds up the don't worry, just relax card. Maybe to assert just that, no frills. Is this it, they shush shush in shattering daintiness, our mutually crystallized caprice? And the magister takes their temperatures soothingly in order for the less cushy dreams to be plucked or retired. It's one or the other, he murmurs, gently tipping the mercury out of its thermal equilibrium. And so the hoppiness of their trampoline liaison is yet to be experienced as more than a reflection. 
The colors of the world are already bouncy and the weather is exactly right for everything to be afloat with fizzings and bridges for an impossibly tangled state to realize that their subjective reading of their own subjectivities is the stuff for ordinary matterings like accidentally breaking the porcelain commonplaces and to conclude better to have a decent cup of tea first than to pause for some flickering. And before you know it, the launching pad for their not so secret coloring adventures is getting sticky from nonchalant use in too much or just not quite enough sun. So, thank you. Thank you, Sophie. Amazing, I appreciate that. So our last uh, reader is Carlos Soto Roman. Carlos is a poet and translator, author of 11 Municipal Poetry Prize winner in Santiago 2018. He has published Philadelphia's Notebooks, Otteritz 2011, Chile Project Reclassified, Goss PDF 2013, The Exit Strategy, published by Belladonna, Rachel here in 2014, Alternative Set of um, Procedures in 2014 also, and uh, Bluff Commune Editions on 2018, Common Sense Make New Books on 2019, and uh, his uh, book Nature of Objects, Mm -hmm. published by Pominar Press in 2019. Carlos lives and works in Santiago de Chile. Carlos. Thank you so much, Gastel, uh, for having me. Tonight. Thank you for <laughs> accepting to join in the very last second. Uh, My pleasure. If you didn't make it, thanks a lot. It's very special to have you here. And thank you so much to the Pominar team for putting together this wonderful reading. Rachel, Sophie, you were awesome. I really enjoy your readings. Uh, and it's, it's going to be difficult to close such a responsibility. But anyway, I'll do my best. Um, I don't know if um, I'm already co-host, so I can start sharing some video while I read the first poem. Miha? Yes. Yeah. Yes, uh, it, it's there. Thank you, Miha. All right. Tratas de percibir este silencio. Las cigarras recién han dejado de cantar. Ahora caen muertas como meteoritos, una a una. Hay un olor a empollo en las calles. Llueve. Los resumideros se tapan con hojas amarillas que parecen cadáveres abandonados. Tratas de percibir este silencio. Mientras soplas levemente tus heridas. Es otoño. Viento mesa los cables, las luces parpadean, el tiempo de los arrepentimientos se asoma tímido tras las cortinas, justo detrás de las cicatrices. Los cines se esconden, los lagos se congelan, ahora es invierno, otra vez. You try to perceive the silence. Cicadas have just stopped singing. Now they drop dead, one by one, like meteorites. There is a free market smell in the streets. It is raining. The drain clocks with yellow leaves that look like abandoned corpses. You try to perceive this silence while you softly blow on your wounds. It is fall. The wind rocks the wires. The light blinks. The time of regrets appears shyly through the curtains just behind the scars. The swans hide. The lake freeze. Now it is winter again.
and from nature of objects. Can you hear me okay? Is, is that is that okay? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, the second part of the book uh, begins with a with an epigraph from uh, the wonderful the wonderful Anne Boyer. I am leaving the bay, and it breaks my heart. Please don't forget, or let me forget. Not the silence, but the space between the objects. Not the space, but its emptiness and its echo. Not the echo, but the remote and unattainable distance. Not the distance, but the movement and the absence. The eye is not a mirror. It's not a window, it's not a glass. The eye is just a prank, it's just a spring lock. Blood doesn't run, just stagnates. It comes together and it curdles slowly. A word is what is unsaid. What we don't say is different what we don't want to say. What we should know what we should ignore, what we should forget. In Spanish, the age is always silent. In Spanish, the is. Not the leaf, nor its color, but the way it falls. Not a flavor, but a texture instead. Goodbye to the void, to the distance, to the wind. Adios is just the same, but from the other side. Don't you ever forget about that. Open your mouth, stick your tongue out, show me your teeth. Hold your hands out with your palms towards the ceiling and fingers wide. Now shut your eyes. Keep your eyes shut and touch your nose with each index finger. Now breathe in, now breathe out, now cough. Try writing a eulogy without sadness. Try writing a sonnet containing everything and at the same time nothing. Try writing the book of a book, the book of many books that don't exist. Try to know the nature of objects. Try to seize the means of production. So what is the opposite of the void? Sways and shatters the pedal of an old sewing machine. There are no drawings, just words. The songs of the tired kissing the pavement, the vociferous concert of the engines in the city. It's not about the benefits of silence, but on the harms of noise. And how about every single night my ears bleed? For Saramago blindness wasn't complete darkness, but absolute white, while in the West White is the color of innocence and purity. In the East, white is the color of mourning. The truth is, I don't know how to write a love poem. Honestly, I don't even know what that word really means. Freedom is not free. Such is the nature of our acquaintance. A lot, a few, nothing. The alphabet is a random thing. A comes before B just because. All literature is made of constraints. In literature all failures, all mistakes are just the same. Achievements instead are all different. Who must and who mustn't inhabit the world? What is the difference between cure and treatment. Poetry is a disease and the antidote for poetry is more poetry. 
language, the words hurt. Poetry is not a symptom, but a sign. I don't know if I can do another year of dishonesty. Things happen too fast for poetry. Whatever it is between you and I isn't imaginary. I know you are here somewhere. This object has been removed for conservation. We're sorry, the page you're looking for doesn't exist. Please try again in 30 seconds. Access has been denied. Good luck and good night. This forecast for London and vicinity will be discontinued on September 28, 2020. This forecast for Brooklyn and vicinity will be discontinued on September 28, 2020. This forecast for Cambridge and vicinity will be discontinued on September 28, 2020. This forecast for Santiago and vicinity will be discontinued on September 28, 2020. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Wow, amazing. So thank you, Carlos. And uh, thanks for to all four readers of tonight, Sophie, Rachel, Carlos, and Doa. I can't see Doa, so unfortunately, I, I think um, she never managed to join us uh, afterward for question and answers. But now I ask everyone to unmute um, their Zoom. And if uh, there are any questions, any comments, we can also uh, write it on the comment box and the um, chat box and I read it loud. But if you also want to ask something or join the discussions, please go ahead, unmute. And Hello? Oh, Rachel, yes? Uh, it's not Rachel. Uh, it, yes, please, uh, Alejandro. How are you? Thank you. Congratulations for the presentations. And I would like to, to ask to, to our Chilean friend, how does he navigate from Spanish into English? And what uh, compromises he must do in terms of, uh, of use of language? Thank you for your question, Alejandro. Um, well, it's, a, it's always a challenge. Uh, of course, it's not my native language, and um, I try to keep up as much as possible. I used to live in the States. I spent uh, a couple of years there, so I guess that is when I felt more confident to start writing in, in a different language, to write uh, in English and to read aloud. I mean, going to readings and perform in English, which I, I keep doing every now and then, but not very frequently, so sometimes obviously uh, the tongue and the language gets rusty. Um, but um, I don't know, I guess uh, those years there and all the readings and all the people I met, uh, all the wonderful poets and, uh, and, 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 and that work that I, I try to manage to keep up, I mean, to try to, to, to read as much as I can from the new things that are being published so uh try to keep myself updated on that front uh keep uh, influencing me and keep encouraging encouraging me to uh keep doing this thing you know uh i've also had uh, have been lucky enough to to travel well last year I, I was in london presenting this book um with gasal and some friends um which was a very um special moment because I mean in Chile we had like a uh, a difficult time uh, exactly those years and uh, 
So uh, it was really nice to be able to perform with Chilean friends in London and to respond from the distance to uh, what was going on here. So yeah, I, I think that's, that's all I can say. <laughs> Thank you for your question though. Pleasure. Uh, Alejandro, you yourself write in many languages, as I'm aware of. Uh, how do you manage that? Well, I, I, if you, I imagine that if you are, if your language is French or, or Spanish, there are some poems that, uh, uh, and, uh, that have shaped us, have uh, given us uh, these uh, tools, because a poem always opens a window for you to see the world. So in that case, I find that um, there are texts that mm -hmm. can, cannot be translated. If you read, for example, the, Spanish, the English translations uh, of Neruda, or I remember, in, I remember we were reading a translation uh, by, uh, by uh, Roberto Bolaño into English, and there was a word, correrse, which the translator translated as to run away or to move physically. But in, in Chilean language that, in, in, in Mexico, because he grew up in Mexico, that word meant something different. What I mean is that uh, when you, I, I, I know if Carlos and, and, uh, and also Sophie and those who read and write in French would agree, but each language has its own music inside of you. And I, I assume that if you would write, if you be a writer in, in Farsi, the way you would describe uh, the, uh, a tarragon, or the way you would describe uh, how how you see the light, will be different in the same scene with 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 the tools of another language. And I think that uh, basically that's. I think we are we allow ourselves to be inhabited by languages, and that's the only way that a, lang a poem then, a text will demand from you, as the, the the language the text you're going to write imposes the choice of language. Uh, in, in, I live in Montreal and uh, as many parts in Europe too. It's quite frequent that you work daily, uh, in two or three languages, if not more. So I think that uh, Italians and French and Spanish authors, please uh, support this idea. <laughs> I have a thought about that, just from, um, just from toggling back from the French of Proust to Lydia Davis's translation, which is a much more exact translation um, than the Moncrief. And there are passages that I read and I'm like, that was really beautiful. I think, I don't think I understood it fully, but it was really beautiful. So I'll go to the, to the Lydia Davis for the whole passage. And I'm like, that's just not happening here in English. Like whatever they, what was going on in French, like none of its meaning is happening. It's not because the translation is not perfect, it is. But um, I just wanted, the short thing I wanted to say in, res in response, my feeling was that in that experience, I feel like there's a way that the, that the, that the inability for the other language to hold what was happening in the origin language feels in my experience, my current experience in toggling, like a kind of a, almost like, a, not even like a disappointment, but more like a bruise. Mm. Like it's a, like a little bit pummeled, like, like the, the being that comes out in the language that can't hold it is like a bruised, pummeled being. I would like to hear uh, Rachel or any of the other poets and um, writers talk about how Rachel's thinking in against travel pushes against this conversation or opens out this conversation in relation to translation. Also, given that none of us are traveling right now, how that thinking affects what you read today or perhaps what you heard from the other poets. Thank you for your question. Thanks, exactly. I mean, I've, you know, I didn't go to uh, London for the opening, for the book party, for the book release, because, but, because I left Paris to come back to New York because I knew there was going to be a shutdown. I left on March 15th. 
and um, and so the irony or the the echo of the the title and of the work did not escape me. And but it's so much of the work against travel is really about. Um, for, I mean, like the notion of against travel for me is a uh, is in some ways captured in Alejandro's question, which is that the or like the notion of like like the ability to, for one to do a map of the world. If the, if the world is what one wants, it's probably not travel that is singularly how one gets it. That's one thing. And also that um, that what we're looking for when we travel is probably, in addition to it being ex exploitative of the world and problematic in terms of footprint, et cetera, it's probably, it probably escapes us what it is actually we're looking for. So there's all kinds of like a, a rub, but also for me, the against and against travel is both um, contra and anti and also together with like you and you're rubbing against something. And Rachel, uh, just uh, to go back to the idea of translation, of what because this text is also translated so what was um your thinking of uh, did you participate in translating that uh text with pascal or how did you see uh, and they're just mirroring each other on the page the english and french how's the conversation between them what is what is happening yeah. in the, these two english and french texts you know, I was, you know, like I said, I'm learning French, and so I, in reading them today in French, I, I realized I actually can read them better than I could a year ago, um, and understand what exactly what Pascal has been doing. But there's um, there's one where uh, the one that's for Ruth, um, and in which there's a line, um, yeah. No reconstruction of some eternal shiny city of anyone's dream. It's just a shitty interior wall. And I and I was looking at it, and, and it's um, you know it's just a, a mere interior de merde. And I thought, you know, like there's a there's a sort of rolling feeling of the shitty interior wall. It's like very casual. And I I kind of wondered about that just just today. But and and. And I could like all the idiosyncratic, like the idioms that I'm using, I'm using so much contemporary queer, like fucked up language. <laughs> and how does Pascal know what to do with that? I, it's always a question, but I mean, he asks me, we, we talk obviously. And, and then I just think it's okay. Like I trust him to make a poem object. He's a, he's a poet and it's a different thing. I don't know. That's really the extent of my answer for that. I think, uh, yeah. I have a question for everybody in the room. I mean, for Sophie and Carlos and Dua too. I know that she's not here, but I would like almost especially Dua, um, but not, not especially all of you. Carlos, you had this line, um, and I don't know if I'm gonna get it right, but you wrote, I don't know if I can do another year of honesty is that, am I getting honesty, actually. I wasn't sure, like, there was yeah. like a little Zoom flip, but either way, I, I was thinking about the ongoingness um, and our ability to sustain, like Sophie, with your, you know, both of you have all these multimodal phenomena and it's a lot of sustaining and now you're having to do it into the Zoom box and um, Dua has been sustaining her practice and her life and her, um, correspondence through this, these incredible um, obstacles of constant war and um, um, oppression by other nations um, in the United States. So um, I just have a question for the three of you, but also of everybody about what you're doing to do it for another year to like sustain this work while Rome is burning or whatever, or like, you know, while we feel bad or like, I don't know, like, like what sustains the work? Hmm. Hmm. Sophie, you wanna go? You wanna go first? Go, you, go, you go ahead. 
Oh, you haven't you haven't speak so far, please. <laughs> Well, I just noticed actually, Rachel, that your question uh, also resonates with someone else's question. Um, Rachel, uh, Rachel's question also um, asked sort of how does the age of Zoom readings impact performance mm. Um, mm. It's in the chat. And so uh, what I've been doing is um, translated quite a lot of pieces into sound pieces or videos. I mean, so these sound, these were sound pieces that were in installation that I played you just like short snippets that you can then listen to and kind of be immersed in that in the fabric and kind of almost um, become submerged in that worm uh, what I called the worm I mean it wasn't really a worm but um, uh, and I think yeah I'm just quite interested in thinking about what how uh, what to yeah to make more videos so I've just been commissioned by a really wonderful collective called Queer Art Projects they're based in um, the UK and in Turkey um, to make actually to make a piece that is based on a lecture performance. So Rachel's question was also sort of about um, approaching a lecture performance. And so a lot of these enlightenment pieces also have, or there's one one lecture performance based on it. It had like obviously all these different components. But yeah, at the moment, I'm just thinking about how what what I can do over video or sound. And I'm really interested in the possibilities of sound pieces to actually create intimacy so actually what I should have really said is um you know that people could have listened over headphones I mean I think it would have been different if it was just sort of if it had been like I don't know a performance or like I would have presented like a full length sound piece you know then I think I really would have asked people to ha put headphones in or I don't know or to to lie down or to do something else um but I think there's something about this is also what I like about installations you know if you have headphones on you're so close to the voice I think that's actually a possibility and you can work with that over Zoom. The other thing I'm doing at the moment or I'm, uh, is um, developing workshops, so performance workshops and how they might work over Zoom and just getting people to move away from the screen, but again, being led by the voice. Mm -hmm. So doing something with our bodies. So we're all kind of connected through that through Zoom, but that moving in space or doing something with our hands. I mean, Gazal, you were one of the workshops that I organized. So um, doing something tactile, engage, like thinking about touch, uh, touching language, thinking about the materiality of language, which also goes back to something I've been thinking about a lot. I mean, for these enlightenment pieces, how can we, yeah, make, make language material? And so how can language exist across these different media, whether it is spoken or it's sonic or it's visual or it's, uh, textile yeah I think that's what I would say yeah I'm thinking about it. oh and the other thing I'm doing also as well is I'm doing this mail out project so if anyone is interested uh, look up I mean either go on my website or look it up or maybe I'll put it in the chat I'm doing this project called Beethoven was a lesbian which is an homage to Pauline Oliveros with my friend Naomi Wu who's based in Canada so we made a sound piece and a mail out project so if anyone would like to have some queer mail art we will send it to you um, I was thinking, like, um, picking up again that the subject of travel bans and um, that um, it's curious, but I, I, I don't think I've ever been so connected with different people from different parts of the world. It's, it's not only because of Zoom, because I, I, I honestly, I don't like very much this platform and I try to avoid it as much as possible. I'm really enjoying this, uh, this, yeah. this conversation, but um, um, yeah, I, I know probably because I work uh, on it, so I, I, I spend a lot of time connected and having meetings and stuff, so uh, I try to reach friends and, uh, and, 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 and poets through some other platforms, but uh, I guess like a, a good old phone call also, it's, it's, it's very nice, or, you know, I've been corresponding with a lot of people, emails, uh, sending or exchanging books, so it's, it's weird how this, this uh, bans or, or these uh, restrictions have encouraged us to be creative and to look for some other different ways to stay connected and to stay in touch and to keep doing things. Uh, this also have uh, entailed like a lot of, of, of workload, I guess, for everybody, you know, everybody's just going nuts. Everybody's just, uh, you know, I mean, the fusion of like the personal space with the working space. And uh, it's so confusing sometimes, you know, uh, so it's it's been hard on, on everyone. But uh, I guess one of the things that keeps me 
alive or keeps me creating is basically to be able uh, to 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 feel uh, the other ones closer than ever, even though we're kind of like it seems that we're like apart. Uh, I don't know. It's been interesting uh, these days to reconnect, to talk with different people. Uh, I was talking with some friends from the states and checking like you know the political situation there. Uh, we have interesting things going on in Chile as well, uh, in London the same thing, so, uh, well, in Syria, you, 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 we started this uh, and, and, and we have more to find out about what's going on there and what happened in Beirut recently, uh, you know, with the explosion and everything, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's being overwhelming, but at the same time, you know, challenging and, and encouraging, I'll say. I was in a performance workshop actually with Miguel Gutierrez who right before school started and it was amazing because they really did do what you're talking about Sophie they made it very it was it was an incredibly dynamic zoom experience for four hours every day and it was, I haven't yet figured out how to do that with the writing workshop but I'm going to get there but um, there was a woman who was in Beirut when uh, in the performance workshop when the explosion happened so just what you're saying Carlos like it, it was it was all so close, like we actually witnessed it happening in time that wouldn't have probably ever happened outside of this context of being in Zoom meetings. And she was like, in a way, held by us, right? Like we, we like in a situation where everybody's traumatized and injured and homeless, she also had this other thing there for her that was other. I mean, I think that probably is not a bad thing, right? So uh, any other questions from readers? There is something, oh no, that's uh, Sophie's explanation uh, for that question. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Hello, ladies and gentlemen, this is Noxan. I don't necessarily have a question, but just a very brief statement, if you will hear me. Go ahead. I'm not really a big person for poetry, and this is my first. And I have to say, I'm quite glad to have listened to all of the speakers. They had much to say through their poetry, even though they were not quite finished. So I'm grateful that you had this session reflecting on what Rachel Levinsky had to say. Yes, during these times, folks, we are not traveling. We're actually not doing very much at all. Yeah. So. Okay because this oh, is a oh, poet's uh, reading yeah okay so no nothing i just uh i was just thinking if um you can also write uh in the chat box but uh sorry i thought uh your comment... just a few more words yeah it's uh or you can also write them um because you are poets yes keep writing and keep creating we are human beings and Fantastic. we need things like this in times like this. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. So um, if you don't have any other comments or questions, perhaps I should thank, do, do we have any, any comments, anything? I think, okay. Great reading. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Uh, so again, thank you to Rachel Levitsky, Sophie Sita, Doa Albostani Al Fatuhi, and Carlos Soto Roman. Uh, if you have another reading, I make sure you all know. And thank you very much for joining us. That was fantastic. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Go home. <laughs> Thank you. Uh.